2 Corinthians 7 and 1, uh, if we got that on the board, uh, I want to want us to read the scripture here. It is, it's a scripture that, that we use for a lot of different applications. But I want to use it in a different way today. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. Let me stop right here and tell you that God's not going to do this for you. You're going to have to do it yourself. Dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit. Notice that little S. That means your human spirit. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. All right, notice this. When we're involved, it causes perfection yes. in our lives. Now, 1 Corinthians 3 and 9. Couple that in your mind with this. 1 Corinthians 3 and 9. Yes. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are His husbandry. Ye are God's building. Yes. Amen. God bless you. You could be seated. Amen. Amen. I remember a little story years ago how a city slicker uh, drove his car out on a farm and, and oh, he, he, he passed by this farm and it looked so nice. And, and so there was a little road there. And so he pulled his car down that road and, and the old farmer was on a tractor and and he pulled over on the side of the road, walked over to the fence, and the old farmer could tell that the man wanted to say something to him. And he said, can I help you, sir? And he said, I was just admiring your beautiful farm here today. It is so beautiful. Now he, said, he said, man, God has really blessed you. And the old farmer says, yeah, he sure has. But you should have seen this farm when, I, when God had it all by itself. Now see, there's just some things in my life that God's not going to do for me. Uh, he put a man in the garden, but He also required the man to till the garden. We are laborers together with the Lord. And whenever God fills me with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, if I can... Uh, be cognizant of the fact that now, I, I, you know, I'm just starting here. Uh, God's filled me with His Spirit. And now I've got to walk in newness of life. And, and the Paul said, till Christ be formed in you. And so there, there's a message to that all by itself. Uh, but the fact is, Paul is telling us that uh, we must cleanse ourselves of all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit. This is an effort on my part. Yes. And notice this, that holiness is not perfected in my life until I participate in it. God is holy, but he says, be ye holy. Now, we don't get that way just because we got the Holy Ghost. We get that way because we've made up in our mind to live for God. And, and we made up in our mind that I, I know I'm on a journey and say, Lord, I, I want to please you with everything that I do in my life. I, as a pastor, I can't tell you how many times I've had people come up to me and say, Pastor, will I go to hell if I do this or do that? Will I go to hell if this, that? And, 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 and I got to the place where I just told them, said, listen, you're asking the wrong question. It's not about whether you'll go to hell or not. It's about whether it's pleasing to God. Where I go, what I view, what I listen to, the company that I keep, is it pleasing to God? So I've got to cleanse myself of all filthiness of the flesh. And of the Spirit, my Spirit. And when I do, I perfect the work of God in my life. 
Amen. Because we are laborers together with the Lord. Amen. And so this is this is this is just an intriguing, beautiful uh, application. Because I believe today that, that 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 many a times we need to be reminded that 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 salvation and our our walk with God is not a uh, automatic thing. We have got to be involved daily in prayer and, and reading the Word of the Lord and, and keeping our mind uh, where it needs to be and and getting rid of some things. Amen. This is why the Lord said that he spoke to the prophet in a still, small voice. Oh, you know why? Because to hear that voice, you've got to be close to him. Many people want to follow Jesus afar off, but you'll never hear his voice over there. We need to be right here so we can hear his voice. There's two times in Scripture of an account where uh, Jesus has fed the multitudes. And these two events, many of us remember these from Sunday school. There was one time that he fed the 5,000, and there was yet another time that he fed 4,000. And with the 5,000, all they had was five loaves and two fish. And with the 4,000, the Bible says all they had was seven loaves and a few small fish. It's like the writer is emphasizing the inadequacy of the, of the congregation. Uh, amen. And here is Jesus. He purposely has brought them out of the city. He brought them away from Chick-fil-A. In and out. Praise God. The best kept secret in America. In and out. Praise God. He, he, he brought them away from Cracker Barrel. He, he brought them away from Whataburger. He, 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 he brought them away from all these things. Come on. And they are inconvenient. You know, they're pre-apostolic, so they're thinking about eating, you know. And so uh, they're there. And it's time for lunch. And, and the apostle or the, the disciples says, Master, uh, we need to take care of the people here. And so he purposely puts them in a position of need. A lot of times that whenever we find ourselves struggling and we find ourselves in a particular time in our life, many times we're quick to say, the devil has done this to me. Uh, we, we were, we're, we're, we're very quick to, to charge the adversary uh, about uh, our, our, our need at the moment. But could it be? I want to challenge your mind today. Could it be that it is the hand of God that has put you where you are? Could it be that, that, that you are feeling and going through what you're going through today because he wants you to rely on him? Praise God. Amen. Amen. So let's, let's don't blame everything on the devil. I'm telling you, the devil's not as powerful as you make him out to be. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. The devil can't do anything to you that he don't get permission first. Amen. And so here he is, they are in a place that, you know, they're hungry. And and and, and he, you know, he the, the writer is reminding us that uh we are not enough. We are inadequate. Uh, and, and, you know, here, nobody in this house is enough. Yeah. Can, can, I, can I say say it bluntly? There is nobody in this building that is very spiritual. None of us have a PhD in living for God. The Bible tells us, oh, how the mighty have fallen. We all need a Savior. Yeah. 
We are not enough within ourselves. I don't care how educated you are. I don't care how, how, how much money you have or how cute you think you are. You are not enough. Amen. You and I need Jesus. Can somebody say amen? Amen. 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 The great thing about it is you don't have to be enough. <laughs> Amen. I praise God. In my weakness, he is made strong. Oh, yeah. Amen. I need him. Uh, you don't have to be GQ for God to love you. You don't have to have all your ducks in a row. You don't have to be the sharpest knife in the drawer. You don't have to be the most educated. Hallelujah. All you got to do is be hungry for God. If you got a hunger, there is nothing in this world that can stop you from receiving what God wants you to have. He that hungereth and thirsteth. An ongoing process. He that hungereth and thirsteth after righteousness shall be filled. Glory to God. Amen. 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 I, I, and you know, here, here's some things. We, we, sometimes we read the Word of God and we read it so fast we, we miss some things. Because when you read these two uh Things here uh, about him feeding the multitudes, that's what we come back off with. Jesus fed the 5,000. Jesus fed the 4,000. But I, I want to submit to you today, there are, far, there are far more greater lessons in these stories than multitudes receiving fish and bread. Amen. I remember... They took the little lad's lunch. And, uh, and you know, and, and the Lord took what the lad had. And he blessed it. We are laborers together. It is not that Jesus needed the little lad's lunch. He could have created fish and bread without that seed. But here, remember, Jesus turned the water into wine. He made wine from grapes that did not even exist. But he did not do it until the servants brought the water. Yes. Without the, the water, the wine would never come. Without the little lad's lunch, the miracle would never happen. Without you and I being invested in our own miracle, amen, we will never go to the next level. Many of us sit in church and we expect miracles to just fall in our lap. That's right. Help us, Lord. Uh, we, 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 we expect just because we're here, that God is going to do all of these things for us. But can I challenge you, my brother? Can I challenge you, my sister? To, to, to your remembrance that none of the things that we hunger for will ever take place in our life until we invest in it. Until you give God your crumbs. He will never give you a loaf. You may say, well, I don't, I don't have much to offer. That's wonderful. Come on, that's enough. Well, you may say, I, you know, I, I, I'm on a fixed income. I, I can't afford to pay tithes. You can't afford not to pay tithes. You know, if you can only pay a dollar a week in tithes, God sees that. If all you made is $10 this week, tithe. I, I still got my daughter's first tithing envelope. And she scribbled, she wrote in her little baby handwriting, she said, there's four cents in this envelope. She paid her tithe on that money she got. Amen. Because we taught our children at a young age. Yes, You cannot expect 
God's best if you don't give Him your best. We have got to be invested in our miracles. Yeah, now, if all you want to do is be religious, you don't have to do anything. You, you can just sit and, and say, okay, that's a pretty good sermon. I, I like the music. And, and go home and be like you always were. But those of us that have made up in our mind that we want to go to the next level, we have learned that we must invest our mind, our heart, our talent, our treasure into the kingdom of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. And so uh, it's God's plan that we give Him our time, our talents, and our treasure. And until we give Him all that we have, we will never have enough. In other words, we must be invested in our miracle. Yes. I want to kind of change lanes here. Will you read about the accounts of the multitudes being fed that are recorded by Matthew, Mark, and Luke, their account simply says this, that after they had eaten, they collected the fragments into baskets. Now, first thing, when I first noticed this long years ago, I, I thought, why, why does a God that creates the heaven and the universe uh, from nothing, uh, what does he need with fragments? And But he tells his disciples, collect up the fragments. Now, th this was before the days of refrigeration. refrigeration. Uh, I, I, what, what, what's this about fragments? And then, then again, to make things even more interesting, when you read the same account in John 6 and 12, it says this, when they were filled... He said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Wait a minute. Not only did he want them to gather the fragments, he wanted them to make sure that nothing went home with them. He wanted to make sure that, that see, he's already provided the fish, the whole fish and the whole bread. And he wants them to give him their discarded things. And so he says, don't just gather the fragments, but gather all of the fragments. Fragments, what are fragments? They're things that are torn and they're things that are ripped apart. I want you to know today, that he is mindful of the fragments in your life. Yes, come on. He is mindful of the rejection and the hurt. He's, re he's reminded of the pain that you've experienced before you came to God and sometimes even after you come to God. God is a master of dealing with fragments. Yes. He knows what to do with fragments when I don't know what to do with them. Amen. Amen. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, every one of us has got a little something we can, you know, we, we can stand up and tell. And I just briefly let you know, I, when I was eight years old, my mom and dad got a divorce. And it was an ugly divorce. And they were both alcoholics. My mother, she remarried and she married a a man that was in the Navy, and for the most part, my stepfather was better to me than my real father. But when I was 10 years old, back then, you know, if the phone rang, you could pick up the line on the other end of the house and you could listen. Yeah, amen. And so I, we were living in a mobile home, and I, I soon realized that it was my dad that was calling I was living with my mother and my stepfather, and he he was an alcoholic too. And, uh, but I got on the other phone and I, I picked up the phone, and uh, I heard my mother and father arguing on the phone. Back then, child support was only fifteen dollars a week for one child. <laughs> 
And my mother said, Pat, if you don't catch up that child support, I'm going to send this boy back to you. And my dad said, don't do that. I don't need that. I'll come up with the money somehow or another. I was 10 years old. And I hung up that phone realizing that neither one of them wanted me. I was a meal ticket. And you know, I can't explain everything. See, God, see, the Apostle Paul said he was called to be an apostle, not on the road to Damascus, but from his mother's womb. God had his hand on me before I even knew he had a hand. God was dealing with my heart. He, he saw me. He knew me before I knew him. He, he saw the little boy that was in agony and torment. And he, and, and he saw the end from the beginning. I didn't know. I didn't have any idea what is happening. But, you know, but somehow or another, I, 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 I don't even remember crying. But inside of me, I said, you know, uh, I love me if nobody else does. I care about me. Now, where did that come from? I don't think it come from me. I believe it was God dropped that into my heart. How many, how many people are in this city today? that are the next Sunday school teacher, the next uh, 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 praise singer, the, the, the next minister, amen, that are sitting on a bar stool today, that, that are strung out on drugs today, amen. But God has got his hand on them, amen. How much more should that wake us up to go through our city and touch lives and, and love on people, amen, and put our arms around people and treat people with the love of God. Uh, but I, I said all that to say this, you see where I am today. And, 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 and it was not because of anything that, that I could manufacture myself, but it was the hand of God. Jesus saw me. And, and when I got the Holy Ghost, I, dealt, I had to struggle. I struggled with it. I struggled. Why did my mother not want me? Why did my father not want me? And then I matured in my walk with God. I gave it to God. I put it on the altar. And the Lord helped me to understand that they loved me the best they knew how. Yes. They were dealing with their own demons. Yes. They were dealing. They were addicted. They were drugged out. They didn't realize possibly that what they were even doing. And I found in my heart, I said, God, I want these fragments gone. I, 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 I'm not going to live with this anymore. And then that's when he spoke to me and said they did the best they could do. They were dealing with their own demons. Amen. And now my, my, my hurt toward my mother and father became compassion. I actually felt sorry for my mother. I actually felt sorry for my father. Instead of taking it personally, God helped me to deal with my fragments. Amen. And so, he says, do not let any of the fragments be lost. And, and you know, uh, he wants them to be gathered but we want to hide them. He told the man of God, stretch forth your withered hand. But what, what, what do we want to do with a withered hand? We want to cover it up, don't we? We want to act like we've got it all together, don't we? Somebody may come up to you, hey, brother, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. Sister, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. You know you're not. You know you just lied. You're not doing fine. You still got some fragments you need to deal yes. with. 
Oh, you're in the house of God, but, but you're letting, letting your fragments limit your growth. Your growth is being stunted by hurts and wounds of yesterday. Memories of uh, uh, being molested. Memories of this and that, that that you struggle with even to this day. And it seems like you get to a certain place in your walk with God, but you can't go any further because you feel dirty and you feel like you're uh, you're not qualified. And you feel, uh, you know, God can't love me. Look what I did. Look what happened to me. And these are the things that I'm talking to you about today that God wants us to put in his basket. Yes. Amen. Amen. I can hear his voice now. Disciples, don't forget the fragments. Make sure nothing is lost. Amen. Amen. Because see, we when we come to the house of God, we don't need to take things home with us. You see this altar right here? That's the basket. You know, you know I, I, what you went through was real. And the pain that you experienced was real. I'm not trying to make a, 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 a short of that at all. I understand, my brother, my sister. I know what you went through is real. But here's what I'm telling you today. Do not allow it to destroy your walk with God and stunt your growth, amen, to becoming everything that you need to be with God. Bring it to the altar. Walk into the house of God and say, God, I got some things I need to put in that altar. Lord, I got some things I need to put in the basket. Lord, I refuse to walk out of that door like I came in. I refuse to carry these hurts, these wounds. These, these bad attitudes, these resentments, these jealousies, uh, these envyings. I, got a, I refuse these chains. And Lord, I'm going to put them in the basket. Amen. Today, I want us to take inventory. It matters what you leave here with. Yeah. Hey, man, I don't know what, let me tell you something. When I was nine years old, my, I, we had a, next door, had a next door neighbor that loved me more than my mom and dad did. And she said, do you mind if I take your son to Sunday school? They said, ah, oh, take him. Go ahead and take him. And so on Sunday morning, she would take me to Sunday school. It was a nominal church, and I watched people. I, I've always been a, a watcher of people. And uh, I noticed that these people told the same jokes that my mom and dad told. I noticed that after church, they would gather out on the steps of the church and they would do things that mom and dad did. And I remember one of my, uh, somebody had a, a, a wedding at the church and there was two bowls of punch. One was over here and one was over here. And I'm just nine years old. I'm thinking, uh, or, no, I'm seven years old. And uh, I'm wondering, man, why two bowls of punch? And I found out the reason why. Because this one over here had vodka in it. This is over here. This is the ones that w w wanted to take communion. And this, <laughs> and this is the one over here that done took communion. And they didn't need no more. And I thought to myself, dear God, you mean this is what Christianity is all about? And see, and as, young, as a young boy, I said to myself, listen. There is no difference between this and what I deal with at home. Yes. And here's what I said to myself. I said, self, I know how to go to hell. And if I'm going to go to hell anyway, I'm going to do it first class. I'm going to go on a skateboard. Praise God. I made up in my mind if I'm going to go to hell regardless, I'm going to just kick up my heels and I'm going to do it right. Amen. And that's what the Apostle Paul said. He said, now that I've come to God, I'm determined that I'm going to be just so great a saint for God as I was when I was out there for the devil. And so uh, 
see, that, that's what religious, religious did to me. Now, if you really want to, well, I won't get into that. But let me, let me give you another example. At the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Amos 3 and 12, probably one of the most abstract verses in the Scripture. You read this and you think to yourself, wow, my goodness. Amos 3 and 12, thus saith the Lord. As the shepherd taketh out of the mouth of the lion two legs. Get this picture. I don't know about you. When I read the Bible, I see videos. Hey, approved videos. Hey, praise God. As the shepherd taken out of the mouth of the lion, two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out. Now, let me tell you something. I don't know about you, but if I was a bystander or passerby and I saw a lion, let's say eating a lamb, a little mutton going on here, and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and this lion has already killed the lamb. And all there is left is two hind legs. Or maybe that's even gone. It's just a piece of an ear that's left there. You know what I'd do? I'd say, seek him, I'm going to pass on by. Because if this lion is chewing on him, he's not going to chew on me. And so I wouldn't let it go. I mean, what, what good is it to save two hind legs? Yeah. For God's sake, what good is it to save a piece of an ear? Yeah. Who sees value in a piece of an ear? Who sees value in a dead carcass? Let me tell you, the good shepherd does. Who sees value in my fragmented mind and soul? Who sees value in my life that, that has been wrecked by sin? I want you to know that the good shepherd dies. This, the Lord loves you when the world will throw you away. Hey man, you are loved of God. You already know what the world will do. You already know what alcohol will do. I want to challenge you today to give God the pieces of your life. And see, here, here's the thing. We say, but preacher, you just don't know me. There's not enough left. I've sinned too much. I've gone places I should have never went. Oh, preacher, if you just knew my past... Oh, my God, brother, if you just knew your future. If you just knew what the Lord wants to do with you. You quit making excuses. Hallelujah. Oh, man, I'm telling you what. You know, he says, if there's nothing but a piece of ear left. Immediately, my, my mind goes to the book of Revelation. He that hath an ear. Let him hear. <laughs> if you'll hear the voice of God today, I'm telling you, brother, it doesn't matter what has happened in your life. There is hope for you. God can revitalize you. God can cause you to be reborn. God will take the pieces that the world threw away and make something beautiful out of your life. And then, you know, you have people say, well, preacher, you, there's not even a piece of ear left in my life. I am consumed. There's nothing. I don't have anything left. You're talking about hind legs and a piece of ear. Let me tell you something. God's got you covered. And he's also got your excuses covered. Because Jesus said, or the Lord said, I'll give you beauty for 
if there's nothing left in your life but ashes, he said, bring it to me. Bring me the ashes. Bring me, amen, the things that are so ugly. And I will give you life. But here is the kicker. He's not going to reach into your pocket and take it. He said, I will give you beauty for ashes. You've got to make the trade. If you've got fragments that you don't know how to handle, God is not going to take them from you. You're going to have to say, God, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of living this way. I'm tired of letting these things hinder my heart and my mind. Lord, I bring them to you and I put them in the basket. Remember what the scripture said? The scripture said, no man cometh unto the Father except for the Spirit draw him. You didn't wake up one day and say, I think I'll live for God. God had to deal with you first. But now it's up to you to say, yes, Lord. We're laborers together, even in our own salvation. Amen. Uh, who's going to walk down in the water? You are. Uh-huh. If you walk into the water, he'll take your sins away. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yeah, he'll wash you. But you, that you have got to walk into the water. I mean, even with the Holy Ghost, listen to this. You're talking about being laborers together? The Bible says he gives the Holy Ghost to them that obey him. Oh, so I'm involved in that too. Yes, you are. We are laborers together with the Lord. You can't save yourself, but you have got to make yourself available. You've got to make your heart available. And you've got to say, God, I can't help myself, but I know you can. I know you can. Because when I look at my fragments, oh, Lord, when I look at my fragments, have you ever got anything at a restaurant that didn't? Get just right, and you want to get rid of it. You bit something, and you wish you would have never bit it, and you want to get rid of it. First thing you do is look around, get your four or five napkins, and go. <clears throat> Whenever I look at my fragments, it sickens me. Yes. When I look at my past and the things that I've done, yes. I don't want nobody to know about that. Everybody's got some skeletons. It's up to us to get them out of the closet. And put them on the altar. When the world looks at your fragments, what does it do? Have another drink. But my, my heart is broken. Smoke this, pal. You'll forget about your heart. Huh? Right? But you don't understand. I'm, I'm, my heart is so broken. And they'll laugh in your face. But there is a God that loves you. There is a God that will never laugh at you. He loves you today. If you're watching online today, I want to challenge you. Whatever it is is hindering you from going to the next level in God, you need to rid yourself of it. Amen. One other Example I, that in Scripture, you know, we, we, we read about the valley of the dry bones. And he asked the prophet of God, can these bones live again? And he said what I would say, thou knowest, O God, I have no clue. Good answer. He, he, he's a politician probably. And, uh, 
But when you read, we, we all know the story how the, the bones came together and the sinew and all this and all that, and, and there was an exceeding great army. But read on later on in that chapter. Do you know one little factor that I think contributed to that miracle? The Bible says that the bones were gathered in the valley. I, I, I've got to gather my bones. I've got to gather my broken heart. I've got to gather my rejection and my molestation and my re, re, I've got to gather these things like wild cats in my life. I've got to gather these things. I've got to gather this and say, God, here it is. I leave it at your feet. And Lord, I'm not going to walk out of that door with it. Amen. I'm going to walk out of here in newness of life. There is nothing that can hinder me but myself. There is nothing, amen, that can cause me not to be used of God other than the fact that I don't apply myself. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Uh, you know, uh, Job had to do this. Yes. Job 42 and 10, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Now you can read something into that scripture because he had hurt a long time before he prayed. Yes, yes he did. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he did. Three of his buddies that he thought was his best friends were ridiculing him. And Job lived with hurt. And Job lived with rejection. And Job lived with, my God, I know I haven't failed God. And here's my best friends putting their foot on my head when I need them the most. But he came to a place in his fault with God that he prayed to them for abusing him. And the Bible says when he prayed for his friends... God turned the ta captivity yeah. of Job when he prayed. He hadn't already always been there, but he got there. And I'll hear one last, one last thing I wanted to bring to you today. And you know, and like I say, uh, do you what what kind of child do you think Jesus was? Uh, I think he was a lot like us, but I also think he was a little weird too. I mean, what 12-year-old says, you find him, he's wandered off, I must be about my father's business. Can you imagine saying that to your mama? Yeah. She did, my mama would have said, well, you're going to be about my business when I get you home. <laughs> uh, Jesus, Jesus was a little boy, but he was God manifested in the flesh. Man, I'm telling you, don't you know Mary could write a book? Yes. Don't you know that there was times, the Bible tells us that the things that Jesus said and then did, did, uh, did uh, uh, were, are not all written down. He said, because the world cannot contain the volumes thereof. Okay, think about this for a minute. What kind of life did this kid live? So think, think, think about the great fish <laughs> that, that, that swallowed Jonah. Think about that dude when he was a tadpole. Think, 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 about, think about him when he was a minna. And he was coming up and all the other fish said, man, you got a big mouth. <laughs> God was preparing. God was preparing this fish for another day. And here's Jesus. He's just a little boy. He, he's wanting to shoot marbles. Anybody remember what marbles is? He, 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 he's wanting to do all this stuff, but he's God manifested in the flesh. But let's talk about what we do know of. Now he's a young man. He's entering into his ministry. And he is doing things that go against the status quo pro. Uh, he is he is strange. He is 
loving people that the Sanhedrin wanted to cast away. Uh, he wanted to bring lepers close to him. He he called unemployed Jews to be his followers. Uh, he uh, he just did all of these things, tax collectors and all this stuff like this here. Uh, he loved on people. Hey, he he forgave sins. Uh, uh, he he raised dead people. He uh, you know uh, blinded eyes were open. All these things. Yeah. And what did he get in return? He's a devil. Killing. He does it through the power of Satan. The devil is in him and he's doing these things because the devil has given him the authority and the power. He's nothing but a wand. He's nothing but a glutton. And here he is. All he's ever done was to love people. Yes. Have you been there? Yeah. Come on. All you did was try to love somebody and what you got in return was hurt and rejection. Yeah. Jesus knows about it. Yeah. Amen. Come on. He was wounded for my transgression. Yes. Yes. Not his. Right. He became sin. He took on my sin. Yeah. He became the whipping post. He became, oh God, did he deserve that? No, he did not. And those that scoffed him and those that left him and those that walked away and those that betrayed him and all of these things, do you think that that did not affect Jesus? Come on now. I'm not talking about sin here. I'm talking about his feelings. Do you think for one minute that all of these people that rejected him and spat on him and said all these things about him, do you think it didn't bother him? Hmm? I believe it did. And so he's hanging on the cross. And he's going to the next step. But one thing had to be taken care of. He looked down at his mother. Where's my other disciples? There's one there. Behold thy mother. Woman, behold thy son. In that crowd, there were people mocking him. They were sitting there eating their proverbial popcorn, waiting for him to die. With every convulsion, with every time he lifted his body up to take a partial breath, the agony and the pain, there were people there. <laughs> they were watching him. They were saying he saved others, but he can't save himself. <laughs> and he's hearing this. Oh, king of the Jews, what are you going to do now? You can't even help yourself. And here he is, suffering like no human being had suffered other than those that were crucified the same way. And he listens to them, and he hears their voices. And the dogs of Bashan are about him. He's, in, he's, he's leaving consciousness, and he's back into consciousness. His world is swirling. His mind, he's bleeding. He, uh, you know, he, he's fixing to die. And he knew that one thing had to be taken care of before he could go to the next step. He said, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them for what they've done to me. Forgive them for their words. Forgive them for not loving me. Father, forgive for they know not what they do. He dealt with his fragments. Every one of us have to deal with them. Is there somebody that you cannot forgive? Is there someone that you are allowing to have control of your heart even today. Yeah. They hurt you 20 years ago and you're still letting them have power. Yeah. Come on. Come on. 
before you ever go to the next level. You're going to have to pray for your friends. Before you ever go to the next level, you're going to have to ask God to forgive. You've got to bring your fragments to the altar.